Today is my birthday and I'm going to give all of you a present. Don't let you, your friends, or your family buy a hybrid and here's why. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Like I said, today is my birthday and I'm gonna give all of you a present. You can give me a present too. If you would take just a second and go down and click the subscribe button and hit the bell notification icon, all of that cool stuff, I would greatly appreciate it. I only call this out once a year explicitly because it's my birthday and 60, 66% of people generally are not subscribed who watch these videos. If a bunch of you decided to subscribe, I could easily hit 75,000 subscribers in, you know, the next 24 hours. So thank you in advance. That would be lovely. So enough of that. On to the topic du jour. Why should you not buy a hybrid and especially not a plug-in hybrid? So first of all, let's look back in time a little bit, back to the early 20th century, the early 1900s. There was a time period when there was pretty significant competition between internal combustion or gas engines and battery electric vehicles. Now, obviously, gas engines ended up winning and there was one very distinct reason why from back then, and that was simple energy density. So if you don't know, of course, gas has a lot of energy in it. <laughs> you can explode it, you can burn it, you can do lots of things with gasoline. It's very, very dense. For one gallon or one kilo or whatever of gasoline, you get a huge amount of power out of it. At the time we were talking about, of course, batteries existed. They had existed for quite a while, in fact, long before the internal combustion engine vehicle, but they had very, very low power, and they were not able to recharge effectively. So it was it really mitigated the effectiveness of battery electric vehicles because it could only go short distances. The batteries were very heavy. They tended to be things like lead acid, although there were some pretty cool uh, different chemistries and everything that people experimented back then. If anybody's interested in a deep dive in this, I, I could do it. I'm not an expert on the subject, but I'm sure I could find one who would be willing to talk about it. There was a lot of really interesting stuff going on, including things like steam engines and stuff like that, external combustion engine vehicles. So there was all kinds of crazy stuff that was going on in the early days, it was the wild, wild west. But the reason why gas engines won was simple energy density. You could compact so much energy, so many joules of energy into a kilo or a gallon of gasoline that you could go much, much further than you could on a battery or, you know, putting coal in a steam engine or something like that and running your car that way. And that, of course, is despite the fact you're wasting an incredible amount of energy when you burn gasoline. Only about a third of what you're burning is actually going into moving the car forward. Most of it is going into wasted heat and all sorts of crazy stuff and pollutant particles and all that kind of stuff. So even with that, even with the incredible inefficiency of gasoline engines, they were able to go further, much further than anything else. And then, of course, World War I came along and, you know, things went very, very rapidly from horse and carriage and everything to mechanized. And you could make a significant argument that World War I and especially the outcome of it and then into World War II all about oil. The 20th century was all about oil and how to get oil and how to, you know, control oil resources and everything like that. Geographically limited oil resources and many, many countries around the world competing for that because they knew that that was the, you know, the goal. That was the thing of the 20th century. So as we move 100 years forward into the 21st century, what changed? Well, the biggest change is energy density. We went from lead acid batteries and things that were very heavy and liquid and all of that kind of stuff to lithium ion batteries and more and more more advanced chemistries. This little guy right here has a lithium ion battery. That's how I'm talking to you right now. My laptop has a lithium ion battery. It's running off of that. My phone also has a lithium ion battery in it and it can run a long time. My car also has a lithium ion battery and it can get, you know, about 300 miles in real world range, maybe 280, something like that under good conditions. That's a pretty long distance that these things can go on that kind of energy charge. So while gasoline still has the advantage in terms of energy density, certainly a tank of gasoline weighs a lot less than a giant battery thing. And as you drive it, the tank, of course, goes down, so it weighs less and less. So it's sort of like a rocket. You know, the, the equation gets better and better as you, as you drain the tank of gasoline because there's less weight involved in that. So it does have all of those advantages, but there are many, many disadvantages with gas engines. Number one, as I said, is that you're only getting about 30% efficiency out of that gasoline. So if you get 100 joules of power out of however much gasoline, only about 30 or so joules of that energy go into driving your car forward. And then when you talk about well to wheel, where you're actually talking about going out and digging down and getting the oil out of the ground and refining it and transporting it to the gas station, putting it in your car, all of that stuff, the efficiency goes way, way, way down for gasoline engines. So again, they have this energy density. They can go a long way on a gallon of gasoline or a kilo of gasoline, whatever units you want to use. But in the end, they have massive, massive deficiency in terms of efficiency of getting the power, the energy from that resource 
into the wheels. Batteries do not have such a problem because you're basically taking a resource, whether it's solar or coal or nuclear or whatever it is, to generate those electrons. You're pushing those into the battery of your vehicle and you get somewhere around 85% efficiency instead. So yes, there's still wasted heat and things like that as the battery's heated up. You have to run cooling solutions through it and all of that kind of stuff. So it's not perfect. There is no such thing as 100% efficiency. It just doesn't happen in real life. But batteries are way, way, way closer to 100% efficiency than gasoline engines are. The second major disadvantage to internal combustion engine vehicles is the fact that these things are Rube Goldberg devices. And if you don't know what I mean, I'm talking about the thing where you put the marble in and it goes through all the crazy stuff and eventually turns the light switch. It's that kind of level of insanity. There's hundreds of moving parts. There's oil, there's heat, there's, all, there's explosions going on inside this thing. It is absolutely insane that it even works in the first place. It's, it's kind of a miracle. It's sort of like a high-end watch with lots of complications, a mechanical watch, something that's absolutely amazing to look at. And you're like, how did humans ever create this thing and make it actually function and then drive for a couple hundred thousand miles without breaking down? It's all really remarkable that it works, but it's insanely complicated. And if you compare that to an electric engine, what you have there is an insanely, you know, not complicated thing. You have at its most basic level, and I made one of these when I was 12, and that was when the light bulb went off in my head, and I was like, why are we not all driving battery electric vehicles? Because the batteries weren't good enough back then, that was the answer why. But basically, I took a lantern battery, one of those little dry cell 12 volt suckers, I took a piece of shish kebab, and I put it between two little posts that were like V'd out like this, so it just rested in between there. I took that, I put a battery on it, I took some coil and wrapped it around the outside and then I applied electricity and boom, that sucker just took off and started running. And I was like, wow, that is dirt simple. Really, really easy stuff. The number of moving parts is down to just a few as opposed to hundreds. The heat is way, way, way less for a battery electric vehicle because you're not, gen you're not exploding things inside of it. It's just operating, right? So you do have to cool it because it does get hot because of course you've got the reluctance and the resistance and all of that kind of stuff inside the motor which generates heat and you have to extrude that. But you're talking about way, way Way less. And one of the reasons why Teslas have a very, very, you know, slopey front end as opposed to the big thick front end that, you know, hits the air is because their radiator is actually mounted horizontally rather than vertically. If you go into an internal combustion engine car, it has to be mounted vertically so that you can get massive airflow through the venting in order to cool off the amazing heat of an internal combustion engine vehicle. With a battery electric vehicle, one that's mounted horizontally that doesn't get as good of airflow is perfectly fine because you don't generate the kind of heat that you do in internal combustion engine vehicles. So again, an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine is a work of art. It's just an amazing thing. And again, it's like a very complicated mechanical watch. But guess what? I have very complicated mechanical watches and I wear my Apple watch all the time. And that's just some ICs and a display. So yeah, it's also complicated in its own way, but it doesn't have a lot of moving parts. It basically, it should, as long as I keep recharging it, last essentially forever. You know, it's the kind of thing that will last way, way longer than a mechanical watch without any kind of repair work or anything like that. And it does way, way more than a mechanical watch. The best a mechanical watch can do is like a perpetual calendar that will go the next hundred years without having to reset, assuming that you wind it up every day, all of that kind of stuff. While I really appreciate mechanical watches and I think that they're absolutely beautiful and I'm the big fan, I, for my daily wearer, I wear a, a digital watch because it's just the obvious solution. And similarly, over the last 10 years, I have gotten rid of every single internal combustion anything you know no more yard equipment no more lawn mowers no more leaf blowers no more weed whackers all of that stuff has gone completely battery and of course my two cars now are also battery electric vehicles so no more internal combustion engine vehicles it's lovely i don't have to have gas cans i don't have to have oil cans i don't have to have all that crap in the in the garage and i don't have leaking oil coming out of the bottom of my car when it gets old all of that is just lovely. These cars are so much simpler. And again, the problem, the reason why internal combustion engine vehicles, one, was because of energy density. And they still have that advantage, which is the reason why you go fly in an airplane, you're still flying on jet fuel, and you're not flying on batteries right now. You know, the, the delta is getting smaller and smaller, and eventually we will be able to do some flights, at least regional flights, on battery rather than on gasoline. And that's going to be a big day. But right now, even given the less energy dense solution of batteries, they have so many advantages. They don't have the moving parts. They don't have the heat that's wasted. They don't have the massive efficiency losses. All of that kind of stuff is all to the advantage of an electric vehicle. EVs without any maintenance should be able to go multiple hundred thousand miles. And many people that I know have actually done that. They've driven their cars multiple hundred thousand miles and they're still fine. And when I talk about an ICE car, an internal combustion engine car going multiple hundred 
hundred thousand miles. That's with a lot of maintenance on the way, right? So it's like all sorts of things, oil changes, uh, potentially tuning changes, uh, you know, spark plugs, whatever. Uh, belts have to be replaced. All kinds of crazy things have to happen in order for these cars to be able to continue functioning for multiple hundred thousand miles. That doesn't have to happen with an electric vehicle. And now that brings us to hybrid vehicles. So you've got internal combustion engine vehicles and you've got battery electric vehicles and you've got hybrid vehicles that sit right in the middle that have an internal combustion engine and also a small battery electric vehicle power plant so that they can run on that. They have electric motors essentially and the gasoline engine in general depends on which hybrid you're talking about but generally speaking it's a generator that generates power that then powers electric motors. And in 2010 I believe it was it might have been 2011 I think it was 2010 we purchased my ex-wife and I purchased a Toyota Prius hybrid vehicle it was not a plug-in hybrid it, you know you drove it like a regular car but it had the battery in it and at the time it was a pretty genius solution again it was like wow this is amazing we're driving a battery electric vehicle it has much faster pickup because it's using an electric motor in the front uh, it didn't have two <laughs> so it wasn't that fast but it was it was snappy and everything and then it had a small gasoline engine vehicle and so it would drive you know 45 miles per gallon or something like that as opposed to around 30 miles per gallon for most other vehicles so it was pretty cool and I, I was very happy with that car and we also looked at a Nissan Leaf at the time but that had like a 60 mile range and the battery life was eh, you know so th at the time and we couldn't afford a Model S so <laughs> that's the situation we were in but at the time a hybrid actually made a, a good deal of sense because it saved money on gasoline and it had the peppiness of an electric motor and everything but when you think about this you've got the worst of both worlds in a sense you've got the lower power density of a battery in the vehicle yes it's only a couple of kilowatts so it's not that big and it doesn't matter as much but it is lower you know power density and then you've got all of the things that come with an internal combustion engine vehicle of the wear and tear the service all of that kind of stuff is built into an internal combustion engine vehicle. So if you want to talk Rube Goldberg situations, this is the ultimate one. You've got all the Rube Goldbergness of an internal combustion engine vehicle, and then you're attaching it to a battery electric vehicle. And that's very, very complicated. And so at the time, again, with the expense and the energy density and everything of batteries, a, a hybrid made sense a decade and a half ago. It was a decent solution and it was a middle step. But even at the time I knew, cause like I said, I was looking at a, a Nissan Leaf at the same time and I was like, oh, we should maybe get one of those, but it was just not good enough. It just didn't have the kind of specs that we needed to have. But it was pretty obvious where things were headed. So we come to 2024, and why are people still purchasing hybrid vehicles? Well, the main reason is follow the money. Who stands to make money from this? Toyota is the poster child of hybrids, right? They've been pushing that for years and years. They're really, really good. They dominate the market. Another really big player is Stellantis. They make a lot of hybrid electric vehicles, and so they are also big pushers of this whole thing as well. And in fact, the CEO of Stellantis recently said that it was going to be a bloodbath if people kept following Tesla's lead and everything and cutting prices and blah, blah, blah. But a big reason for that is because what they primarily make is hybrid vehicles, not fully battery electric vehicles. So you've got major players that have a big stake in keeping things the way they are. They don't want it to go to a 100% battery electric vehicle because they no longer have the advantage that they did have with hybrid vehicles. And that's one big reason. The other big reason is dealerships themselves. So all Auto dealerships do not make a ton of money off of vehicle sales where they make most of their money is from doing service. And guess what needs service? Well, internal combustion engine vehicles. And guess what's in a hybrid? An internal combustion engine, right? So there you go. You need service for that. Guess what doesn't need service? An electric vehicle because they have so few moving parts and the temperatures are so much lower that there's so much less wear and tear on these vehicles. So you've got dealerships and major automotive players who are pushing hybrids and plug-in hybrids very very hard to make people go that direction and it's all for their sake it is not for your sake at all so as a consumer what is the best for you well the best for you is a battery electric vehicle clearly that is the future that's the way things are moving that's just the nature of the beast but second to that if you don't want a BEV just buy an efficient internal combustion engine vehicle I don't recommend that I think it's a terrible idea because I think the car will have no resale value after a couple of years because nobody's gonna want an ICE car anymore but you could buy a used one right Right? which is already depreciated to some extent. So if you're like, I don't want to get a BEV yet, it's just not the time for that. Whatever you do, do not buy a hybrid. I would highly recommend getting an internal combustion engine vehicle used right now over 
you're buying a hybrid vehicle, used or new, it doesn't really matter. It's not the right solution. It's the worst of both worlds. It is a terrible idea. And of course, if you look at the statistics, it's obvious that electric vehicles are going to fully electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles are going to take over light transport. That may not be planes and, and trucks are going to be difficult too because they have high energy density needs and everything, but you know, Tesla's making inroads on that as well as our other companies. So I think pretty much all ground transportation and a lot of ocean transportation over the years is going to go battery electric. Light transport in terms of automobiles, you know, cars, pickup trucks, things like that, that normal consumers buy is going to go 100% or very close to 100% BEV within the next decade. And we're going to get to 80% globally in five years, <laughs> four years, five years. It's going to happen very, very fast. And so it is a bad idea to purchase a new internal combustion engine vehicle just in the sense of you're not going to have anywhere to resell this vehicle. Nobody's going to want it in five years when you're ready to sell the car. So if you're purchasing a new vehicle, you really, really, really should get a BEV and you really, really, really should get a Tesla, unless you live in China, in which case you'll have some other options. But there's really, in the Western markets, there's no other good options aside from Tesla, especially in the United States with the tax credits for the Model Y. It's just a no-brainer. It's a very inexpensive car relative to what you get. But if you can't afford an EV or you're not ready to make that jump yet, just stick with internal combustion engine vehicles. Stick with the car you got right now if you can. If you can't, go buy a used ICE car. Do not buy a new internal combustion engine car. And whatever you do, please, for goodness sake, do not buy a hybrid. It is a terrible, terrible idea. All right, so again, that's my present to all of you on my birthday. I hope you appreciate that. Let me know what you think in the comments. I have a feeling there will be a few people who will not be happy about that. But hopefully there will be some of you who will be like, wow, I was in the market for a new car and this gave me some other things to think about so I really really hope that that helps and again to say thank you and happy birthday to me just go ahead and click the subscribe button it's that easy thank you all for that and I will see you in the next video bye bye